one of the big challenges we have with innovation is where do we innovate? There's lots of opportunities, but where do we start? We've got limited resources. We need a strategy. We can't do everything. And one of the questions that we really need to explore and what I want to spend some time on now is do we look for all the places in which we could innovate? Big question, very important for innovation strategy. So what I'd like to do is spend the next few minutes building a little map before your very eyes. And we'll use this map to look at where we could innovate. Do we explore all the space available to us? Now, one of the ways we can innovate, of course, is in what we offer the world. I'll call it a product here, but put that in inverted commas. It could be a physical product, it could be a service, but it's what we offer to the world. And we can change that. Very importantly, we can change this along a spectrum. From close to the center, doing what we do a little bit better. Right the way through to the edge where we might do something the world has never seen before. But I'd like you to imagine this spectrum from do better right the way to something completely different. Now there's a problem with innovation because very often we get excited about the dramatic stuff, the radical change. That makes good television, it makes the newspapers, but most innovation isn't like that. Most innovation is rather boring. Most innovation, most of the time, is doing what we do a little better. But it's worth doing. Let me give you an example. This is a pen. Specifically, it's a Bic Crystal ballpoint pen. And it's interesting because once upon a time, 60 years ago, 1951, it was a radical change. This was the world's first mass market ballpoint pen. But it's been around a long time. Now, if you ever visit London, you'll see one of these in a glass case in the Science Museum. It's actually a museum exhibit. You might have been to the shop and bought a new one of these. And you could go in the museum and look in the glass case and take the one from your pocket and compare the two. And you might be forgiven for thinking, what have these people been doing for 60 years? It's just the same, which superficially it is. But of course, if you take the one you've just bought and write with it, it's much better. It doesn't have that streaky, greasy ink we used to have. If you put that ball under a microscope, it's a wonderful piece of engineering that's got better and better. Count how many holes there are in the pen you've just bought. These are not defects in quality. All these holes in the pen are for good reasons. There's a lot to do with balancing the ink flow. The big hole in the top of the pen is actually there for one very simple reason. We tend to chew pens, children particularly, and some of us accidentally swallow them. So the hospitals and doctors have said, please put a big hole in the pen so if you swallow it, you can still breathe. So what we're actually holding superficially looks the same as the one in the glass case, but actually it's the accumulation of 60 years of doing what we do better. And it's worth doing. 12 million of these are sold every day around the world. That's a huge number. I didn't believe it myself. Check their website. That's not bad for a 60-year-old product. And it underlines just how valuable continuous incremental innovation can be. It won't go on forever. I'm sure there'll be another radical change in writing instruments, maybe very soon. But it does remind us we have to think all along that spectrum, from the radical new thing that this once was, right the way through to doing what we do better. But there's other ways we can innovate, and another dimension is what we call process innovation. And what we mean there is we can innovate, we can change the ways we create and deliver whatever it is we offer. This pen doesn't just magically appear. There's a factory that makes it with all sorts of processes. And upstream from that, there's a supply chain, and someone has to buy the materials and transport them and deliver them. And downstream, there has to be sales and marketing and distribution. What we actually have are a set of activities, processes, which create and deliver whatever we offer. And we can change that. The same rules apply. We can do that a little better right the way through to something the world's never seen before. Now, many of us have heard words like total quality management, 
business process improvement, lean thinking. These are all words for doing what we do better, taking the waste and the trouble out of our existing processes. And anyone who's been involved with that will know there's enough to keep us busy in innovation, just improving the processes we have. But what happens if we go to the extreme? What happens if we do look at radical process change? Well, let's have an example. I'll like to use an example from the world of glass, and in particular, window glass. Now, if you think about a window, a window to see through it has to have two important properties. It has to be flat and smooth. If ever you've seen some of those medieval buildings with those old windows, you can't see through them because the glass is deformed. So what we've done with making windows is basically make glass, and we've done this for centuries, and then grind and polish to make it smooth and flat. And lots of innovation happens there. New grinding techniques and new grinding powders and someone invents a machine. Lots of do what we do better around grinding and polishing. Until one day in the 1950s, this guy was washing up. Now in England, we have a traditional big lunch on a Sunday. So you have to imagine they haven't got a dishwasher. He's standing at the sink and they've had a big piece of meat and all the juice and the fat and the grease from that has slowly congealed and is floating on the surface of the water. You see that picture? Now, he works in the glass industry and he has one of those bing light bulb moments. Wow, wouldn't it be great if we could make glass this way? If I don't stir the water right now, underneath this layer of fat, it's perfectly flat perfectly smooth and you can see the brain starts to work. Great idea if we could make glass by pouring it on water and letting it float, wouldn't that be clever? Yes, but it doesn't happen like that. It took them 10 years and about a million tons of scrap, but finally they managed. Now you don't need to understand the technology, but what they came up with was the Pilkington, that was his name, float glass process. And the only thing you really need to know is that 96% of the world's windows are made now using this new process. It made the fortunes of the company, it changed the way we make windows. But it doesn't happen like that. It takes time, a lot of experiment. If we're going to do that, we're taking on quite a lot. Now, we may not all be experts in glass, but something we do all do is go shopping. And this next picture is in the world of shopping. Now, we have a store in the UK, I'm sure many of you might know of, called Sainsbury's, a big chain. Now, Sainsbury's began at the turn of the 20th century, and this was the typical store. It's a lovely picture. You, the customer, even get to sit down. And those smart men in their bow ties are there, ready to serve you with whatever you want. From the customer experience point of view, beautiful. From the productivity point of view, for the store owner, not so good. And so whilst we had lots of incremental process innovations, we had a radical innovation in the 1950s in Europe, which was the supermarket, self-service shopping. But just like that glass example, the idea, great, it doesn't just happen. This is a picture from the time when they first opened a supermarket. And what's going on is that this lady, looking very worried, is being reassured. The gentleman is saying, it's okay. You can take the stuff from the shelf, put it in your basket. It's not stealing. That's how you do it. They even had to print a comic strip, a leaflet, to explain to people how to do self-service shopping. Now, you might think, how stupid were people in the 1950s? I say that, but then in my store right now, we have this self-checkout, the self-scanning. I'm in as much trouble as that lady. I love this picture. It was one of the first stores they opened in the town of Eastbourne on the south coast. And never mind what's going on in the shop and the wonderful old technology at the checkout. See the people looking through the windows. This is a tourist attraction. Nobody's seen anything quite like this. And it serves to remind us radical change doesn't just happen. We have to educate people, we need new equipment, we need new skills. We have to do a great deal if we're going to make a success of radical process change. Okay, so far then we've got plenty to keep us busy in terms of our innovation space just by changing what we offer the world 
and the ways we create and deliver that. But there's more, more ways we can innovate. Another way is what I call position innovation. Now you can imagine we could have a product which we make with an established process. What we change is the context in which we place it. Maybe we talk to a new market segment or we open up a new geographical area or we change the story we tell to people. Branding and advertising is all about telling stories, positioning an idea in our minds. And we can change all of that. And that, of course, is very much where marketing people make a big contribution to innovation. Here's an example. If you take the idea of ice cream. Now, I suggest there's a story about ice cream, typically in this picture. It's children. It's a lovely sunny day. If the children are good, as a treat, they can have an ice cream. Do you remember when these people came on the market? This was not ice cream for children. This was ice cream very much targeted at adults. It was sold as a sensual pleasure, something that you might do behind closed doors late at night. The advertising was very much this rather risque approach. It's frozen milk, for goodness sake. It's not a complex product and it's certainly not a complex process. What the company brilliantly did was define a new market segment. If you look in a supermarket now, there are shelves full of adult ice cream. It's a classic example of position innovation. The Nintendo Wii. Wonderful device. Nintendo began the computer games industry. Remember Super Mario Brothers, all those things? But they lost the race compared to Microsoft and Sony. The game became hugely about boys and power. Powerful processors, powerful Xboxes and uh, en engines, powerful games that used that, very much about power. Nintendo changed it. They had this gadget, this little wand where you could interact with the computer, but the games themselves were really simple. Very simple graphics, sometimes very old characters, simple games like tennis or bowling, very, very simple things. But basically they changed. If you imagine my family, before we had the Wii, we have a big Christmas lunch, Christmas lunch, all the families together being a family. As soon as we finish the lunch, the boys are in their bedroom on the Xbox, gone. When we bought the Wii, different happened, different things happened. When we finish lunch, we clear the table and we start a family bowling competition. And grandmother plays and wins. Change the thing, it opened up the market space. Classic example of position innovation. But then we get to an interesting question. What's the equivalent of our radical process or our radical product? What does radical position innovation look like? Well, I'd suggest it's the case where a market doesn't exist and then emerges. And that's interesting because it doesn't just happen. Markets don't bing, happen, perfectly formed. By definition, a new market starts at the edge. It's a bunch of people who want something that nobody else does. Maybe they can't afford what everyone else has. Maybe they've got very different needs. They're over there and the main market is here. Now, that's a rather worrying space because for most established organizations, they're concerned with the established market, not what goes on over there. We've seen this, a very good example, with flying. It used to be the airline business was all about airplanes and airports, and then came this new group of people, the low-cost airlines. Now, they didn't start off with a new product or new process. They're still about airplanes and airports. What they started with was saying, who doesn't fly yet, but might? Who's at the edge, not existing yet in the market? Well, several people, students, love to travel, but they have no money. Or grandmother would love to visit the grandchildren, but only has enough money for the bus fare. So there's a potential group, but they can't afford it. But if we could come up with a low-cost solution, and that's not easy, we have to come up with all sorts of ideas, but if we can, we can grow that market. Now, interestingly, what happened early on was for the main airlines, Lufthansa, British Airways, that's not a problem. Let them get on with it. But interesting things happen. First of all, something grows over there. Innovation happens to meet the needs of that group, but it also moves. And one day my son comes to me and said, Dad, I've just paid this EasyJet company £60 to go to Amsterdam. And I've just paid British Airways £600 even I can do that mathematics. Hmm. And at that point, the whole game changes. Disruptive innovation.
So it happens very much around position innovation where new markets emerge and then meeting their needs creates a solution which everyone wants. And of course, these days we have a lot of over there. We talk about the emerging markets, but most of the world's population are there. And they are very different, not least they haven't got so much money as the mainstream marketplace. But many solutions which emerge over there just because billions of people need them are likely to find application there, but possibly disruption here. But we can innovate in even more directions. There's one more. I've tried to make all these start with a letter P. I was struggling here, but I've used an old Greek word, paradigm. But a paradigm is our mental model. It's the spectacles through which we see what we do and who we do it for and how we do it. We can change that. Let me give you a very trivial example of how changing the way we think about things opens up new innovation space. This is from the world of athletics. In athletics, you see this gentleman here doing the high jump. This was the London Olympics 100 years ago, and he's doing very well, nearly two meters, but he's running and jumping over that stick. 50 years later, this woman down in Australia is running and jumping over the stick, and the record has got much higher. But anybody who understands athletics might know what comes next, a revolution. First of all, in Mexico, so it's very high level, very hard to do athletic performance, and yet this man, Dick Fosbury, manages to push the world record way, way higher. But he does it in a way no one else has ever thought of. He runs and at the last moment turns his back, throws himself over backwards. Why would you do that? But in the process, he opened up a completely new way of thinking what became the way we do high jumping. And now if you watch the Olympic Games, that's how high jumpers work. It's a small example of changing our mental model which changes everything about how we do something, opens up innovation space. And of course, these days in the business world, this is where business model innovation becomes really powerful. Rethinking the way in which we do things, perhaps across the internet. Look at what Amazon has done to retailing. Transform the game, changing the business model. Rolls-Royce, one of my great favorite companies, make beautiful aircraft engines. But they've realized that their customers actually don't particularly value beautiful engines. What an airline wants is power. Power keeps planes flying and that's how we make our money. A plane on the ground because the engine's broken is no use to us. So actually what Rolls-Royce realized is that their customers would like power by the hour. It's a different business model. It forces them to rethink the way they approach their whole business. Not just making engines, but looking after them over perhaps 30 years of their life. Another example, I've just emptied my attic, part of my roof, and I've discovered five different generations of music. I have my vinyl collection, which I owned. I have my huge cassette collection, which I owned. I have my CD collection. On my computer, I even have my iTunes collection. I own all of that. But these days, I have a different supply of music. I have three and a half million pieces of music I can have on any device I want, wherever and whenever I want it and I don't own any of it. I've moved to one of these rental services. I use Spotify, but there are many of them. I no longer need to own my music. This shift from ownership to rental is another example of business model innovation, which is changing the game. So, to conclude, anywhere in that yellow space, incremental, do what we do better, right the way through to radical change, and not just along the black lines, but anywhere in that yellow space, is where we could innovate. A question any organization should ask itself, number one, do we explore all the space? And are we clear why we innovate in the places we do innovate? Have we got a balanced portfolio, a few risky bets and a lot of safe bets, incremental change? And what space have we left untouched? Because that's where an entrepreneur might say, hmm, I can see an opportunity there. So there's a big question. Do we really explore all the innovation space?